right, now we're ready to go. Okay, guys, so what we're going to be taking a look at today is the end all of the models of the atom. It's the modern quantum model of the atom, sometimes called the quantum mechanical model. And uh, it takes Bohr's model and kind of throws it out the door, puts in a more sophisticated model. And we're going to take you through some of the parts of this. When you first learn, the first day that you're learning uh, about the modern quantum model of the atom, it's definitely like a little strange. You're just like, how do these things fit together? But we look at the pieces of the model, and then I can show you toward the end how it kind of looks when it's all assembled together. So I gave you a note guide, finally, because I realized I didn't have it photocopied, uh, to help you take some notes with this, and we're just going to launch into it. Bohr's model was the first quantum model, but unfortunately, it only worked really well for hydrogen atoms. He described the bejeebies out of hydrogen, but for other elements, there were some flaws in his uh, equation. So it took other scientists like Louis de Broglie, uh, Warren Heisenberg, Erwin Schrodinger to create the quantum mechanical model of the atom. The modern model is primarily a mathematical model, mathematical model, which is not really meant to be visualized. It's not something that you're supposed to uh, go around with a little picture in your head like Bohr's model. Um, we still like Bohr's model because it does give us that visual image of energy levels and electrons moving around between the energy levels. But the modern model is primarily a mathematical model. So we try to visualize the individual pieces but we don't necessarily try to go around with the whole picture of the model in our head. It's just a little bit more complex than what's comfortable for most people. When we're talking about this, we're going to be talking quite a bit about something called orbitals. And that's kind of a key term throughout this rest of this week, orbitals. An orbital is a three-dimensional region of space where electrons are likely to be found 90% of the time. According to uh, Heisenberg and Schrodinger's model, um, we can't pinpoint the electrons in an atom. All we can do is describe regions of high probability where electrons are likely to be found. So there is some uh, looseness or flexibility to the uh, modern quantum model. Allows for a little bit of un uncertainty. Orbitals also have different shapes and sizes. And that's where things will get a little strange for you today because uh, in Bohr's model, it's these simple little rings around the nucleus. And in that modern model, it's definitely more convoluted. <clears throat> Each orbital can also have a maximum of two electrons. So keep it in mind that atoms have huge numbers of electrons. Some atoms have 118 electrons. If we're going to accommodate 118 electrons and orbitals can only hold two electrons each, then we need at least 59 orbitals in an atom to accommodate all 118 electrons in the biggest atoms. So there's lots and lots of orbitals in the electron cloud. And that's kind of how we structure and break things down is by talking about orbitals a lot. Next screen. What we're going to focus on for most of today is something called quantum numbers. And quantum numbers are actually mathematical pieces of information that fit into the quantum mechanical model. They're descriptors of the electron cloud. We use them to describe the probable locations of electrons in an atom.
quantum numbers are used in a way that's very, very similar to the way we use an address system to find the location of an individual person. You know, you start out with a big range, narrow it down, narrow it down, eventually get down to the individual. So, uh, for example, we could say first number would represent like Wisconsin, big region of space. A lot of people in Wisconsin, so then we narrow it down a little bit further. Next one's Brookfield. Okay, now we've left, you know, narrowed it down to like 35,000 people. And you just narrow it down a little bit further. <coughs> and if, you, if you get really far down there, then you can get down to the individual electron. You don't have to put Noah's, you don't have to put Noah's address, but them, you're welcome to, that's, that's encouraged, actually. Everybody go to Noah's house tonight. Yeah, he said he's throwing a rager this, this really? weekend, this, next weekend. Yeah. Coming? Well, yeah. All right, nice. I got this right off the invite. Okay. There are uh, four quantum numbers needed to locate an electron, and each one does what an address does. It takes it from a big area to a more specific, to a more specific, down to the individual electrons. The next thing is a number. So we're going to look at each of those quantum numbers and kind of break down what's going on with them. The first of those quantum numbers is what we call the principal quantum number. And the principal quantum number, we give it a symbol um, and we'll use this symbol so it's kind of worth knowing. And we used it for Bohr's model as well. It's the lowercase letter n and represents the energy level that the electron's in. This is the one part of Bohr's model that kind of carries over. Bohr had energy levels. The modern quantum mechanical model has energy levels as well. And just like Bohr's model, he numbered them one through seven. We got one through seven in this model as well. So that, that all carries over. Um, another thing that his, the energy level tells us though, is it helps us figure out the uh, distance the electrons are from the nucleus, very similar to Bohr's. But it also gives us an idea of the size of the orbitals that we're talking about. Because there's lots of orbitals in the electron cloud. And depending on what energy level you're in, they're gonna either be smaller or larger. The bigger the energy level, the bigger the orbitals that we're gonna be talking about. So energy levels can be your most comfortable one probably. Everybody okay there? The next one, narrowing things down to a more specific location, this is where it kind of feels like it gets a little weird, is what's called the angular momentum quantum number. Now, by the way, L, uh, by the way, principal quantum number, I don't care that you know it's called principal quantum number. If you want to call it the energy level quantum number, that's good. And same with, uh, the angular momentum quantum number, that means nothing to anybody, right? What does angular momentum mean? I don't know. This is gonna to refer to the shape of the orbitals. The second quantum number refers to the shape. First one's energy level, second one's shape. And it's got a symbol. It's a cursive lowercase letter L. Don't ask me why I don't make this stuff up. And when it comes to those four shapes, We have four different names for them. They're actually quantum numbers, so they're numbered, the shapes are numbered, zero, one, two, and three. But um, they're called by the S shape, the P shape, the D shape, and the F shape. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a couple of those up there. 
And the first thing I want to point out is that axis with the dotted line, it's just talking about a three dimensional axis. You know, you got the X, Y, and then you got the uh, Z popping out of the page at you. So it's just reminding you that this is taking place in three dimensional space. The S shaped orbital. more than a sphere centered over the nucleus. So it's a spherical shape. Oh, it's not sphincter. I mean, it might be. Could be. Kind of looks like sphincter. Okay. I'm not the tiny it's not, it's the It starts with the S, so S shape. Like sphere. Then why not put sphere, sphere shape orbital? Because it, there's it's, it's slang. It's slang apparently. Um so here's the first thing that's a little bit confusing about an S shaped orbital. It's not a path, like a circular path, like a racetrack that the electron goes around on the edge. Force model was wrong about that stuff. It's just a region of space where the electrons are likely to be found. So somewhere within this sphere, you don't want to shade it like I did, but somewhere within this sphere, you can expect to find an electron 90% of the time. Spherical shape. I don't like my shading there, so I'm going to get rid of it. Then it gets a little bit weirder than that. The next one, the P-shaped orbital. P-shaped orbital looks like this. Again, it's not a figure eight racetrack. It's a three-dimensional region of space, kind of looks something like this, except not crooked, something like that. Three-dimensional region of space where electrons are likely to be found 90% of the time. Somewhere within that region of space. Anybody know what this is called? Wait, dumbbell? They call it dumbbell shape, but that doesn't go with P, does it? No. So, uh, mine looks like, mine kind of looks like kidneys. Kidney shape? Eh, can't use that either. How about, uh, you know, a double nutter? Not a single nutter. Not the elusive triple nutter. Just a double nutter. <laughs> Like, like two peas in a pod. Yeah, sure. Why did you Why did you draw kidneys? I, I, I just not. I have, I have a little hand-eye coordination problem there. Yeah. I got it. All right. Next shape. They all get a little bit more sophisticated from one shape to the next. This one. Oh, I'm, I'm just gonna. I do that a little neater. Made it a little bit too bulbous. Not my best work. Well, this is coming together now. There we go. That's how I was drawn the first time. I like to be a little bit more symmetrical. Got a name for this one yet, Julian? Dandelion. Dandelion shape? Because it's definitely not a dandelion, but it's That's because it's a daisy. Oh. The daisy shape. Which would be like, I don't know, if I had one of these crisscross with another one of these. Just a very bulbous daisy. And then uh, the F shape, the elusive F shape. This one's tough to draw. Yeah, I've got to change this. Hmm. 
I can't draw. But it's 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 a fancy shape. That's what F stands for, fancy shape. Can I see we Google it? I'll show you a picture later, but I can't draw it. You can't draw it either, so we're not gonna try. Fancy, yeah. Fancy. Fancy shape. I know you're thinking now he's just making crap up, you know, messing with this, but those are the four different shapes that uh, occur in the electron cloud. So we got the energy level, distance from the nucleus. The energy level number will also tell us, tell us the size of these different shaped orbitals within the electron cloud. So if you're in a higher energy level, you got bigger peanuts. And if you're in a smaller, lower energy level, you have smaller peanuts, bigger spheres, smaller spheres. Big daisies, little daisies. Okay, all right. Big question marks, little question marks. Bigger the atom, the more questions you have. Third one is the magnetic quantum number. I don't really call it that because it doesn't mean anything. Just throwing the word magnetic quantum number in there doesn't tell you a thing about it. So uh, I think of this as the orientation quantum number, the orientation of the orbital. It's abbreviated with an M sub L, you know, subscript L, lowercase m, subscript L. And uh, like it says, it's describing the orientation in three-dimensional space. So this is, um, As a beginner, this, this particular one is going to just seem like, I don't know, maybe the weirdest at first. Because S-shaped orbitals always occur as a singlet. There's only one S-shaped orbital in every energy level, and it always occurs alone as a single. So there's only one way to position a sphere on an XYZ axis. You just position it in the center, one orientation, Maybe I'll write that under here. Going on orientation. And it's centered. So they give the orientation because it's quantum numbers, they give it an orientation of zero. And you'll see that you'll see with the next one why they use zero. For the P-shaped orbitals, the peanut-shaped orbitals, where there's one P-shaped orbital, there's, there's going to be three. They always occur in a group of three. And uh, they have different orientations, those three different P-shapes. So one's going to lie on the X, one's going to be on the Y-axis, and then one's going to be popping out of the page at you and going into the page on the Z-axis, X, Y, and Z. Sometimes they call them P, PX, PY, and PZ, just because they're on the different axes. But uh, I always refer to the, the one on the left, the one in the middle, and the one on the right. And then there's a numbering system for them, because we have to distinguish one from the other. So the numbering system is a number line. Negative one, number one in the middle, and plus one for the one on the right. It's also the reason why uh, S shape is zero because there is only one and it's in the middle. So they just give it a zero, kind of like the same zero we have here. But uh, three orientations. Three orientations going with the T shaped orbital. One thing I should have kind of prefaced this with, I was going to brush at the beginning there. Um, most of this week is just going to be about learning pattern, patterns, seeing patterns, recognizing patterns, finding them. People are better than that than others. We'll get you all there. But um, the human brain actually likes, it's kind of like a puzzle. Finding patterns is what human brain likes to do likes to categorize things and put things in categories. 
So uh, that good that's good. That's good for this. This is uh, as strange as it sometimes may seem. It's uh, it's something that people are good at finding the pattern to. Uh, for the D shape, daisy shape. That one. All right. So, what's the pattern you're know, noticing about the D shape? What's different? Well, it's symmetrical. So, like, wouldn't it be like just the name, but the What would be the number line? Negative two. Negative one, zero, plus one and plus two. Turns out there's five different orientations, so that's how that's going to number itself out. And we'd have one daisy kind of like that. This is where I get sloppy. I, I don't ask you to draw these things, by the way. Okay, I might ask you to draw some peanuts, but I'm not going to ask you to draw daisies. But then I, you got to put them on different orientations, and that's kind of hard to do in, in two dimensions or something that's three-dimensional. Put something between the axes. Put one on that side out. It doesn't really matter. This one's kind of goofy though. You put a donut around it. You take this and then you put a donut around it. Like, uh, yeah, like, like like sticking a peanut through a donut. Like it does kind of look like a pacifier, though. Good call on that. So D shapes always occur with five different orientations. Um, essentially, each time you add another uh, shape, you're adding another one to the left and another one to the right. So, you know, the S is the only one, it's a singlet, then you add one to the left and one to the right. Now you add another one to the left, another one to the right. And then because it's a pattern and everything's a pattern, when you get to the F shapes, you would add another one to the left and another one to the right, bringing you up to minus three, minus two, minus one, zero in the middle, plus one, plus two. I'm not going to even try to draw that, but you can imagine rotating it in six different or seven different orientations. So that's a, the clumsiest one to get used to, and um, you'll see why it works that way as we get further along into this. We'll go back to one that's a little bit easier for the next one. But before I do that, let me just show you uh, some of those shapes in professionally rendered drawings. Like, okay, S, P, D, not that much different than what I was doing, but I wasn't kidding. The last one is a peanut stuck through a donut hole. Doesn't look like a daisy to me. Maybe it hasn't blossomed yet come out of its bloom yet. Um, so SPs and Ds. Um, the thing about these shapes that I'm drawing, I'm drawing them like cartoon figures, you know, with a solid shell on them, but they're really clouds. Like the mathematical model that we're talking about, it's a cloud. It's saying somewhere in this region of space, the electron 90% of the time, and that's a P shape. We're not going to draw it like that with all the dots and stuff like that and try to make it all cloudy and fancy. But that's what they're really talking about. It's, it's a cloud that has a certain concentration to it. Same kind of thing. You know, there's a lobe there, there's a lobe there. You know, that's where they get the daisy shape from. So it's not, it's not a solid outline. This is actually the one that's got the donut hole thing going on. You got the peanut that sticks out, and then this is kind of like the uh, 
the ring of the donut hole that's sort of wrapping around it, which is a little bit more diffuse. We're just describing these clouds with these different shapes. Clouds with shapes, that makes sense. And then uh, this is your F-shaped orbitals. You can kind of see why I don't like drawing those. It was a current group of seven. Kind of looks like a firework blowing up. And then here it looks like we've got peanuts and donuts mating with each other. But you don't need to know specifics. You don't need to be able to draw it. You just need to be able to say, oh yeah, it's an F shape, whatever that looks like, fancy shape. Because this is not a model that's meant to be carried around in your head as a picture. Then the last of the four quantum numbers is the spin quantum number. This is actually the one quantum number where the title kind of tells you what it is. It's talking about the spin, specifically the spin of an electron on its axis. Spin quantum number. M sub S for magnetic spin quantum number. When an electron is in an orbital, there can only be two electrons in the orbital. And apparently, in order for two negatively charged electrons to be in close proximity to each other, they have to spin in opposite directions. So one of them spins in a clockwise direction, and the other, just like Earth spins on its axis, electrons spin on their little axis as well. And just like Earth has a north and a south pole, turns out electrons, when they're spinning like this, also have a north and a south pole. So uh, apparently when they're spinning in opposite directions, they can be closer to each other in the electronic cloud without uh, repelling each other too much. Um, because they have to have opposite spins in the orbital, we give them one of two values, negative one half, positive one half. And again, it's because it's a mathematical equation that they go into. Um, that's the way they chose to designate them. Negative one half and positive one half. I think of it, um, the negative and positive in a couple ways here. First off, I don't care if you associate clockwise with negative. That doesn't matter to me, clockwise negative. You could say counterclockwise is negative. That doesn't matter to me. But um, what I like to do, just so that we always are all describing the same electron in the same way, I always like to say the first electron in the orbital is spinning with the negative one half. And because it's negative, it's lonely, and that's a sad thing. It's a negative thing. But when you have two electrons in the orbital, now you got one with a negative spin, and the second one in the orbital is spinning with a positive one half. And that's a positive thing because now they're, a, they're an electron couple, and they're paired up, and they're happy, and they have a friend. So uh, negative when you're lonely, positive when you're paired. And uh, first electron in the orbital versus the second electron in the orbital. But like actual clockwise and counterclockwise, it's kind of irrelevant. Just know they spin with opposite, opposite uh, rotations. So those four quantum numbers can describe every electron in the electron cloud of an atom from the energy level to the shape of the orbital it's in. We can get into the orientations, which is a little clumsy at first. And then we get down to the individual electrons and one spinning clockwise, the other one spinning counterclockwise. Next thing that goes with that, oh, I better have this. Wait, so for Kim, can you go with the first electron in an orbital spins with? The first one spins with the negative one half because it's lonely and it's a negative thing. I'm going to that too. The 
at least 100 copies this morning. And next sheet. Yeah, we can do without it for now. I'll give you guys a little bit later. My game this morning. Just get it ready to copy for you guys in a little bit. Or do you just want to break and I'll go copy it right now? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. This will take me less time than the other one because it's a single sheet. I'm going to just copy it right now. I don't want you guys to be uh, having blanks in your notes. Here is All right, let me show you what the map is all about here. If you guys would label a few things on here. So for the first day, maybe the first two days, we're going to use this map just to kind of get you situated as to the uh, pattern that the electrons fill in the electron cloud with. Turns out that this pattern is actually built into the periodic table, but you're not quite ready to see that pattern yet. So for now, we just kind of use this as our, as our starting point. The first thing I want you to do is just label off to the side that each one of those circles represents one orbital. We're not going to draw them as S's and P's and D's and F's. That's too messy. We're just going to use a circle to represent an orbital. And we can put a letter next to it. Like this is an S orbital. This is an S orbital. This is a P orbital, three of them. Here we got some D orbitals, so we can put a letter next to it, but um, each circle represents an orbital. And make a note to yourself, each orbital can have a maximum of two electrons in it. When we fill in the electron cloud of an atom, we're going to start with the lowest energy level first the first energy level. So down at the bottom of the map, that's actually your starting point, And the electrons fill in in this pattern. So it's kind of like uh, you are here, 1s orbital. And you just follow the dotted line, filling up your electrons as you go. As you go up the map, there's more and more energy. So you get to higher and higher energy levels. It's more difficult to occupy the higher levels. So electrons always try to pack themselves in as low as possible. We call that the ground state. We try to stay in the ground state as much as possible because it takes energy to get bumped up to a higher level. The other thing I want you to jot down is that you'll notice in, for example, the fourth energy level here. Here I've got 4s. Up and to the right, I've got 4p. I've got 4ds over here. I even got 4fs above that. So in the fourth energy level, there are S-shaped orbitals, P-shaped orbitals, D-shaped orbitals, and F-shaped orbitals. When you take your energy level, the fourth energy level in that case, and divide it by shape, we call those sublevels. So the S sublevel of the fourth energy level, the P sublevel of the fourth, the D sublevel, and the F sublevel. So we'll use that reference or that term fairly often as well. Lots of sublevels here. 
In fact, the only energy level that really doesn't have a sublevel is the first energy level. It's just got one orbital and there's no sublevels of it. So uh, this next page I just handed you, um, I just refreshed this page like last night. That's what I was doing last night is cleaning this one up because my old one was just getting to be a copy of a copy of a copy. Um, the top of the page is just telling you, you know, quantum numbers. That's what we're working with. Um, it's telling you <clears throat> what each of those quantum numbers is about, which we've already done. But at the bottom of the page here, this is where I want to start you guys out. So we know electrons have a specific filling order, and that's where that map comes in. The filling order is also called an electron configuration, which illustrates how the electrons enter the orbitals. For our first example, we're going to take a look at a sulfur atom. Sulfur atom is atomic number 16 on the periodic table. So that has 16. or its number of protons and electrons. If I was to take that map that you're looking at, and I was to look at where those electrons would go, if I took that map and I put it horizontal instead of vertical, it would start feeling like this. First electron, you give it a direction. Any one of those? Yeah. The second electron is going to spin the other direction so we give it a down arrow and then you filled up the first energy level s orbital with its two electrons when that sub level is full or that energy level is full then we go up to the next one 2s give it one up down and one down then from the 2s we go to the 2p sub level everybody's getting one electron before they get their second electron when you deal out electrons in a sublevel like the P's and the D's, everybody gets one before they get their second. So one, two, three, come back, four, five, and six. So that's 10 electrons. I'm trying to get up to 16. So this is 11 and 12, 14, 14 15. 16th electron a different color because we're going to talk about that electron in a moment. That's called an electron configuration. You put the symbol out in front of it. It's describing what all the electrons are doing, where they're located in energy level, the shape of the orbital. We even got the orientations here. Negative zero, negative one, zero, and positive one. Um, and we got the spins being shown with the arrows. There's another way of showing that, and textbooks love to show it with the up and down arrows, but students and teachers much rather draw it this way. Just faster when you do it on your own to draw circles. And uh, when we do it with the slashes for one spin and backslashes for the other spin. So one, two, three, four, everybody gets one. Give them their second one. One, two, one, two, three, and then that last electron again is going to be this one right here in red. Exact same information 
in both of those diagrams. Um, again, we're probably going to stick with the circles and the slashes. It's easier. So then the next thing I'm going to have you look at is let's say we were looking at the quantum numbers and we wanted to describe the last electron in the sulfur atom, which would be the one in the red. And we want to assign it four quantum numbers to pinpoint and describe the location of that one electron. First question I would have for you is what energy level is it in? What energy level? The red electron, what energy level? Three. This number represents the energy level. So we got the first full, the second full, and we're finishing up here, we're in the third energy level. So the first quantum number would be the third energy level, n equals three. Next question, what shape orbital is that electron in? Oh, um, P. P shape tells us that right here. And what number goes with the letter P? One. One. Yeah. The, the S, oops, the S, P, D, and Fs are zero, one, two, and three. So this is a one, which represents the P shape. Next one is the clumsier one to get used to. It's the orientation quantum number. If we were to put these three P-shaped orbitals, that's, these are all three Ps, on a number line, which orientation would we, would we be talking about? Orientation. Yeah, which orientation number? Negative. negative one. The one on the left is negative one. If you wanted to write it above it or below it, you just say this is negative one, this is zero, and this is positive one. P's always occur in a group of three. We put a number line under it. So we're talking about the one on the left. And then the last quantum number is talking about the spin of that particular electron. This is the second electron to fill up this orbital. Negative one half or positive one half? Positive one half. Because when you're paired, you're positive, you're happy, you've got a couple, you got a mate. It's kind of like when Josh comes over and sits on your lap, you know? That's not a positive thing. So I got a lot of, lot of information there. Like, I don't expect you to like, be like, oh yeah, perfect sense. But uh, this is kind of where we're going with it, so it's a good, good way to start. We got some electron configurations here showing where all the electrons are located. And then we got the quantum numbers over here that just kind of pinpoint one electron and give details about that one electron. Let's take a look at the other side and see if we can continue this. But before I go down to the examples below, I just want to point out this right here. This is like a good kind of cliff note version of what's going on. You know, we got the energy levels, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. That's the only options for N. We got the shape, S, zero, P, one, D, two, F is three. We got the four different shapes that are possible. S's are always zeros, P's are negative one to positive one, D's and F's, you get the different orientations that are possible. And then first electron or second electron. So that's a real good kind of summary right there. So we're gonna do the same thing as we did on the previous one. We're gonna look at the four quantum numbers for the last electron. But to get there, we're gonna do that little map thing again. So this time we're going to do it for boron. And we look at boron on the periodic table. It's element number five. It's got an atomic number of five, which means it's going to be five electrons. And we're going to put them in the first energy level and the second energy level. So this is the order that all electron had gone. Yep, every element has the same order. I'm not going to go as with many circles, because I don't need as many circles to accommodate just those five electrons. But all those orbits are there, whether you, the atom's using them or not. 
So like the more that there are, the higher you go up. Yeah, the, the bigger the atomic number, the more circles I'm going to need to accommodate all those electrons. So with boron, there's five. I'll do one, two, three, four. And then I'm going to make the fifth one red, just so it stands out. So that's where the five electrons of boron are, are located when it's in its ground state. I got two in the first energy level. I got a total of three in the second energy level. But I want to describe that last one. So my first quantum number is n for energy level. That number is going to be one, two. And what makes it two then? Because it's the last electron, so the number goes to two. Oh, okay. Second energy level. Last electron. L represents the shape, S, P, D, or F, which one? P. P, so P. and P gets the number one. You see that at the table on the top. You're just getting used to it, so you got to look at your references. Then the next one is going to be the orientation of that orbital. The left, middle, or right, but we put it on a number line. So what's the left one called? Number. Negative one. Yeah. And then the last one is telling us is the electron single or pair? And it's single, so the quantum number for that is negative one half, because the first one's always negative one half, and the second electron in the circle would be positive one half. So those are every one of those five electrons has a set of four quantum numbers that can be used to describe it. But we don't necessarily want to do that for all of them. So I always focus on the last electron for the quantum number description. Otherwise it gets a little bit tedious. Okay, so, so it's negative one half if there's like an odd number, like the attitude of an odd number, like the attitude. Uh no you can't necessarily like, um I well, think about like no, just, you got to look at the picture. For now, you got to just look at the picture. I guess I'm confused, yeah, I'm confused about like the axes and the dashes. Like, what, like... First electron, second electron, third, fourth, and then fifth. So you fill up the map. Every orbital can have two electrons. So you got to give them their two electrons until you run out of electrons. So that's where you stop. So then why would you only have one electron? Because there's five electrons to work with. Five electrons, that's where we ran out. Okay. Just like dealing out cards, eventually you run out of cards. Okay. Where you stop, that's where you're at. So like you like you have to fill out two for each one like until you're out. Right. <laughs> Take a look at uh, potassium, see what's going on with that. Potassium's K. It's got 19 electrons. I had to give more circles here because I've got more to fill in. 1s, 2s, 2p. The pattern's always the same. 3s, this is 3p, and then we go up to 4s. And then we'd start counting off our electrons, counting up to 19. 1, 2, 3, 4. Everybody gets one in the P's before they get their second one because when you're dealing cards that, you know, to multiple players, everybody gets one card before you deal them the next, just like dealing all cards. That brings us up to 10. Here's 11 and 12, 13, 14, and 15, 16, 17, and 18. And I'm going to make the 19th one a different. That's the one we're going to describe the four quantum numbers for. So we've got the Electron configuration here, which shows where all the electrons are located, but we're going to give the details about that last red electron. Okay. Anybody think they can give me all four numbers for that one? Maybe. Okay. N is four. N is four. Fourth and energy level. L is zero. Because it's an S, and yeah. S's are zeros for their shape. And then and now I would say zero. zero. There's only one option. If you look at the table at the top, there's only one option for an S orientation, and that's yeah. zero. Yeah. And then I would say 
There's one electron. The first one is negative. The second one's positive. The lonely electron is negative. The paired electron is positive. Boring. Atomic number nine, nine electrons. We always put the symbol out in front just so the reader knows what element you're describing, even though we have it up here that's just proper habits to get into. 1s, 2s, 2p. And you start counting off your electrons. That's uh, seven. And it's really important that you do it one at a time when you get into the P's because otherwise you're going to land in the wrong spot. So that's seven. Here's eight. And number nine is going to be right there. I know it's not Dane Court, but no, can you help me out with this one? I know it's not Dane Court, but can you help me out with that one? Two is good. Got it. Mm -hmm. This is electron. Yeah, because you're trying to describe that one. Or you want to describe that one. You want to describe the one with the last. The last electron is what we're going to, so that would be positive one half, yep. Yeah, if you were describing this one, it would be two, one, one, and negative, but. So remember when, yeah, go ahead. When you're filling them in, everybody gets one before they get their second one, and that's where we end it. It's all about following the pattern. Why did they the last one for two? Because that was the last available one. Yeah, that, when you fill in an S orbital, oh, it's like one player at the table. So you give him one card. We ran out, but we would have given him another card right away because he's the only player at the table. OK, these are a little bit bigger, but I'm going to have you guys try these two. Manganese is uh, at 25 electrons. So if you're looking for atomic number 25. And uh, arsenic has 33 electrons. Use the map, put the numbers underneath the circles, and then uh, see where you come up with. Okay, yeah, when you're doing like, because like there's three C and P, why do you start with two P and that one? Because you go, isn't it like two and two indicates the energy level, and in the second energy level, you have S's shaped orbitals, you have one S shaped orbital, and you have three P shaped orbitals all in the second energy level. So it's the second energy level S shape okay. and the second energy level P shapes. Um, 
one thing I, we haven't encountered a D-shaped orbital yet. So now it's like you're sitting at a table with five other players, you know, playing cards. Um, this is 20 right here. So this is 21, 22. Everybody gets one before you would go back. But I ran out of cards here, so that's as far as I'm going to go. And I'm just going to make that one red. And that's one we'll to describe. We'll do that in a second. I'm going to just fill this one in. Everybody got one. I have enough to keep going. So now they get their second one. Which is 30. Um, so at this point, you are strictly kind of following the map, following the dotted line. 1S to 2S, 2S to 2P, 3S, 3P, 4S, 3D, 4P. So we're just taking, it's actually built into the periodic table. You just don't know where the pattern is yet. So eventually you'll begin to the point where you're just looking at Um, like, for example, see the seven periods on the side? It's not a coincidence that there's seven periods and seven energy levels, because this is the first energy level. So that's the 1s. This is 1s with one electron. This is 1s with two electrons. Then this is the 2s with one and two. And then this is the two p's over here. That's why it's six across, is if you take three P-shaped orbitals and give them each one, that would be the three P with one, with two, with three, and then you go back and give them your second electron. So that's why this is six across, because it's the P's. Then you go back to the three S, the three P, the four S, and then you go back to the three D, it is out of order, drops down one, and then you're back up to the four P's and it just keeps on going. So it's all built into the table. We're just on day one, so. I don't expect anybody to know what the pattern is or even be anywhere close to knowing what the pattern is today. But we're going off the map that answer. So let's uh I got a vote. Uh, I want to get somebody else. I know you know it now. Go for it. Uh n equals three. For manganese, n equals three, third energy level based on that number right there. L equals D or no. D, D has what number? Two. Two. Yep. D-shaped orbital, and then we go up to the top and just remember zero, one, two, or three. Uh, orientation. Uh, positive two. Plus two. And I don't, it, if it's not negative, you can just, you know, but I'll put the two in there to emphasize it. And then the spin? Uh, negative one half. Negative one half. That's all we want. Describe it. That one electron in detail. Good. Even though we know where all the other electrons are, that one electron's in detail. Somebody uh, brave enough to take on arsenic? It's a deadly poison. Oh, okay. yeah. Sorry, John. Four? Got it? Plus one. plus one for this one? Mm -hmm. Because negative one, zero. Oh. Okay, so that. Okay. And by the way, for this one, we didn't do it here, but we could have negative two, negative one, zero, plus one, plus two. That's where. That's the nice thing about looking at it in this this form of electron configuration is you got a picture to kind of label things and you know work your way through it and stuff. But um, eventually, we'll get to the point where we can streamline this. Sure. I'm going to just do something here at the end. Uh, and I don't have a homework assignment for you guys tonight. You know, maybe a good thing to do would just be to kind of review this and say, OK, it's kind of strange. 
but I realize it's day one and I don't have to have anything memorized yet, but just, you know, like get a, get a feel for it. But let me just show you this. I told you that this is not a model that's supposed to be a picture in your head, like Boris model, you're supposed to kind of have that picture in your head, but you can try to picture it. And I'm going to do that a little bit here. So, orbitals, you got your S's, your P's, your D's. So, an S shaped orbital, depending on what energy level you're in, it's either a small S shape, like the 1S, or it's a bigger S shape, like if you're in the seventh energy level and you have an S orbital. So, the size of the shape changes. Likewise, if you're talking about a P shape, you know, maybe it's a small set of peanuts in the uh, in the second energy level, a little bit bigger in the third and a little bit bigger when you get to your fourth energy level. But same shapes, just further away from the nucleus because they're bigger orbitals. So the shapes and you have the donut one different orientations. I just try to make them without the axes. And we're ready for this part. So this is why you're not necessarily supposed to try to visualize this, but it is kind of fun to try. If we had only two electrons in our atom, they both go in the first energy level and they both be in the S shaped orbital. And we'd be basically saying that those electrons are going to be in this little region of space 90% of the time. That's what quantum numbers do is they narrow it down to a higher area of probability. But let's say then you go to the second energy level because maybe you're starting out with lithium or beryllium and you're starting to put those electrons in there and they got more electrons. When you go to the second energy level, it's also a beginning with a sphere. It's an S-shaped orbital in the second energy level. It's a bigger sphere. It's a little bit further away from the nucleus. That's why it takes more energy to occupy that space. But it's a sphere that completely engulfs the other sphere. So now we got a sphere overlapping a sphere. There's a lot of crossing over in these things. Then you go into the P-shaped orbitals. Now you're starting to go over from boron over to neon and you're adding one electron, two electrons, three electrons, and you're just kind of working your way across the second period. And uh, you add one P-shaped orbital in there because you know you just added one electron to that side. Now you're gonna add another electron, so you're in that one. Now you add another electron, so you're in that spot. And now they come back and they get their second electron before you move on to the, to the next. But now the 2P, it's the same energy level, second energy level, but the 2Ps are a little bit further away from the nucleus. And that's why they're kind of a step up, a little bit higher, a sublevel. So the dotted line takes us up a notch. Then you go to the 3S, third energy level. And that's a sphere. And it's got to be a big sphere because it's going to be further away from the nucleus and require more energy to occupy that space. So it's now we're at like sodium and magnesium. We just added one electron for sodium. Oh, added another one. I guess we're talking about magnesium. You go up to the three Ps. Electrons. A little bit further away from the nucleus. So everything's overlapping everything else. But yet we can still describe the mathematical model region of space where they're supposed to be located. Add a 4S in there. That's got to be a big sphere further away. And then we go back and actually go from the third back down to the third energy level. So I'll do these back in blue and we'll get one of the one of the D-shaped orbitals, another D-shaped orbital, another one, another one, and I'll throw in that one with the donut right in the middle. Now mine's kind of like a little distorted because everything's like uh, two-dimensional, two but this would be all happening in three dimensions. And then if we did go on to the four P's, but I have a little bit of room left. P, just a little bit further away than the D's and another one. A little bit further away from the nucleus, requires a little bit more energy to occupy that space. And that's why it's further up on the map. So 
four model, easy to visualize. This model, you could try, but nobody's expecting you to. We actually just focus on the parts and we focus on describing them with uh, things like, like our electron configurations and our quantum numbers. We just describe the parts more than we try to draw the parts. Um, all right. I don't think I want to do anything else with that because that's enough, right? Uh, one thing I could do because we have a little time is I could pass back your test from last week because we never did that, right? Yeah. So let me do that. And again, no homework for tonight. 